all right hello and a very wonderful good afternoon or good evening to you depending on wherever you are joining us for this presentation you're all warmly welcome to the very last talk in the spring edition of the Shannon Lecture Series in History, uh, which is actually tackling the issue of the management of natural resources and the environment in Canada, historical and transnational perspectives. I must add that this is actually the virtual edition of the series. Today, we are still discussing the very important issue of the environment and the sustainable um, environmental practices associated with that. Um, to do us the honors of leading the discussions is a wonderful researcher and advocate of the environment, uh, who is actually a retired emeritus professor of history, whom I shall soon introduce. I am Stephen Osei Owusu, a graduate research assistant and a PhD student with the Department of History at the Carleton University. And I'm the convener and host of the series. Before we proceed, permit me to do a few acknowledgements um, of institutions and personalities that have assisted us to hold this program thus far. Uh, this presentation also acknowledges the location of Carleton University on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. And that additionally, I should say that I, the host of this edition, have been coming to you live from the University of Cape Coast, located within Cape Coast, which is a ceded territory of the Fetu people of Ghana. I would also want to say special thanks to the generous donor of the Shannon Endowment Fund, that is Lois Long, whose donation has made the Shannon Lectures possible since the year 2002 and has contributed to numerous graduate scholarships. Finally, I would also want to say a big thanks to the Shannon Fund Committee of the Department of History at Carleton, under the chairmanship of Professor James Miller, and as well as a big thanks to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences for their continued support. Well, um, above all, I would also want to say um, a special thanks to our sponsors who have stayed through with us all throughout the organization of this series. And in no particular order, permit me to acknowledge the contributions of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies, the Institute of Political Economy, the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, the Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Science, and last but certainly not the least, the Institute of African Studies. As I mentioned earlier, we are honored to be hosting um, a learned professor and emeritus professor in history, that is Professor Ronald Rudin, to be giving us his talk on the environment this afternoon. Um, professor Rudin, um, for emphasis, I would want to mention that you have 25 to 30 minutes to do your presentation. Then after, we would also have about 20 to 25 minutes of question times where we uh, want our listeners to engage you on the nature of your presentation. And so without much ado, Professor Runa Rudin, your audience, audience, Professor Runa Rudin. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming out and thanks to all the people who are for making it possible. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging I'm speaking to you today from Montreal and unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters where I am today. Jajogi, or what we call today Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it's home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And in addition, I need to acknowledge that the research connected with this presentation was carried out within the territory of Bigmagi, the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Our relationship to this territory was agreed upon in the Peace and Friendship Treaties of 1752. Because of this treaty relationship, we need to acknowledge that we're all treaty people 
and have a responsibility to respect this territory. In the midst of the climate emergency, we're constantly reminded of the importance of protecting nature. And I'm putting the nature here in air quotes. So here are two examples that have recently come to my attention. Parks Canada, for instance, encourages Canadians, and this is their expression, to connect with nature in places conceived to protect it. I'll come back to that in a moment. For its part, the city of Montreal is encouraging residents to come to such facilities as our botanical garden, offering a season pass to provide what they call in the slide here, unlimited access to nature. So to be sure, it's hard to be against nature. And that's certainly not my intent, but rather my goal today is to encourage us to reflect on what we mean when we refer to nature. And in both of these cases, Parks Canada and the city of Montreal were referencing environments that were shaped by human interventions, no matter how much they might want to constantly talk about displaying nature. Now, these are environments which incorporate elements of non-human life forms, so flora and fauna. Indeed, these environments could not exist without a human intervention. In the case of Parks Canada, which I've written about previously, for over 100 years, Parks Canada removed all evidence of a previous human presence in our national parks to make them appear more natural. But of course, that was a fiction. The fact is that we're easily seduced, and I certainly learned that in doing this project, we're easily seduced by such landscapes that appear to be natural, some of which are more respectful of sustainability and biodiversity than others. And so we need to focus less on claims however uh, attractive, on claims that something is natural. And we need to focus more on the nature of the, or the kind of human intervention that made a given landscape possible. In order to encourage such reflection, this presentation is designed to take you on a journey through the history of a particular landscape in Atlantic Canada over the past 50 years. More specifically, we'll be visiting the, sh the shifting contours of Petticodiac River in southeastern New Brunswick. So assuming you could actually follow my, uh, my cursor here, uh, this is the source of the Petticodiac River, which travels past Moncton and ultimately into the Bay of Fundy. Along the way, the Petticodiac flows through hectares of farmland, but also so through the city of Moncton, the third largest city in Atlantic Canada, on its way to the Bay of Fundy. Flowing into the Bay of Fundy doesn't really tell the whole story of this environment because twice a day, the tides of the Bay of Fundy, the largest in the world, move up the Petticodiac, confounding the notion of what is upstream and downstream. For millennia, prior to the arrival of settlers, the tides twice daily brought millions of tons of rich sediment onto the lands that were inhabited by the Migvac the Big Mouth First Nation. The sediment provided the perfect medium for the growth of marsh grasses that served the indigenous people well, providing a source of food that nourished fish and other wildlife that they consumed. Indeed, it's been shown that marshland provides more caloric value per hectare than more modern forms of agriculture. But when Europeans, first Acadians, and later English speakers saw this land, they made no particular effort to recognize the value of the marsh grasses and instead created structures that were designed to drain them. So what we see in this, uh, this sketch is effectively what the settlers constructed. First, they constructed dikes, uh, which were designed to hold back the tides of the Bay of Fundy. But just as importantly, maybe even more importantly in a way, they, created, they built sluices, what were called abato, uh, into the dikes. Um, they had um, a gate on them. It only opened outwards. And so on the inland side of the dike, uh, waters that accumulated from rain or from spring runoff could pass out uh, at low tide. But at high tide, when the waters might have pushed up against the gate, the gate would then be pushed closed. So the salt water couldn't uh, intrude uh, on the land. So with this system in place, 
In a couple of years, marshland effectively was drained and became arable farmland. And for nearly 300 years until the 1930s, the drain marsh supported farms, particularly ones that grew hay, as we see in this picture, uh, which was taken uh, in the early 20th century on farmland bordering on the Petticodiac River. But by the 1930s, the hay market had collapsed with cars and trucks pushing horses aside and killing the demand for hay. Farmers didn't have the funds to keep up the dikes and there were reports of land going out to sea, which was the expression of the time. And so I, 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 in my research, I found many uh, photographs uh, like this from the, particularly from the 1940s. In response to the situation, the federal government in 1948 created the Maritime Marshland Rehabilitation Administration to fix the problem. And uh, the, the research I've done in the book that I published uh, effectively uh, uh, explores the, like, the history and legacy of what more easily I describe as the MMRA. And I'll just make the point now, but I'll come back to it later, that the title of, uh, that was given to the MMRA that it had to do with rehabilitation was significant because the idea was that the, the in a way, the, the, the proper, I'm, I'm reluctant to say natural, but the proper state of this landscape was the one in which salt marsh had been drained and made into arable farmland. And so in a sense, what the MMRA was designed to do is to rehabilitate the land that had been flooded and turn it back uh, to dike land. But there was never any idea that the rehabilitation had something to do with reestablishing the salt marsh. The presumption was that the, the, the normal state was what I think we can call dike land, land that had been drained because of the dikes. The MMRA assembled engineers and heavy machinery to rebuild the dikes in Abato, sometimes borrowing from the farmer, farmers, such as uh, the man we saw earlier uh, sitting on his uh, but by from people uh, such as that man who had been responsible for the dikes for centuries. But by the start of the 1960s, the MMRA had largely finished that work, that is the reconstruction of the dikes in the Abato. But it wasn't done, and it kept uh, working for another decade before it wound up operations in 1970, building a series of dams, tidal dams, across a number of the major rivers that flowed into the Bay of Fundy, one of which was constructed across the Petticodiac River at Moncton. The idea was that the dams would save money by precluding the need for maintaining dikes and abato upstream. So, you know, the, the thinking was that if you simply put an obstacle in the middle of the river, you could just let the dikes and the abato go and considerable savings uh, could, be, uh, could be made. But unlike the other dams, the one across the Petticodiac, which was completed in 1968, had almost nothing to do with protecting farmland from the tides. Instead, this dam was conceived almost exclusively uh, to facilitate transportation between Moncton and suburbs that were growing quite rapidly in the 1960s on the other side of the river. And so while this, this dam, and we'll, we'll look at its environmental impact in a moment, has the appearance that it was somehow controlling water, uh, in fact, its major goal was to provide uh, a link between the two sides of the river. So what went over the dam in a sense was more important than the dam itself. Unlike the other dams, the Petticodiac Causeway, as it became known, was not built near the mouth of the river. In fact, you can see on this map that it was located 40 kilometers upstream with the result that the sediment that washed up twice daily was deposited on the seaward side of the dam even while it was being constructed, making the river narrower and shallower. And so um, I quite like these, well, like isn't probably the right word. I find informative uh, these two photographs, uh, the before and after. So if you look at the 1963 photo, a river that was uh, more than a kilometer wide. By 1976, with the causeway in place, uh, the river effectively had been re reduced to this very narrow channel. Um, the darkened in uh, area was effectively sediment that had been dumped uh, on the seaward side. So if you kept going, you would get Bay of Fundy. On the seaward side of the causeway, and as we'll see later, uh, became home to marsh grasses, which grew on, um, on the sediment. In changing the dynamics of the river, the causeway also killed one of the Petticodiac's most popular features, 
uh, the tidal bore. They saw gigantic waves moving upstream, making it one of the biggest tourist attractions in Atlantic Canada. I mean, in fact, uh, I mean, this was this is a postcard. In fact, that somebody sent back home, uh, telling people that they had had a great time seeing the tidal bore. And uh, there, there, in fact, is to this day in Moncton a, a kind of stage where you can sit and watch the tidal bore as it goes by. But the Petticoatian Causeway had the result because it was this gigantic obstruction in the middle of the river to, in fact, kill the boar. Um, so that surfers who came to Moncton, because people actually did surf, and I'll come back to this again later, people surfed on the Petty Kodiak, and these are three, uh, three guys from the States who came up in 18, 1967 and who came away disappointed, uh, and I interviewed one of them, because the construction of the causeway, uh, which had just be, had already begun, it wasn't finished until a year later, but even when it began, it was already destroying the tidal bore. And so um, they came away uh, disappointed because the causeway had already changed the environment. But this wasn't all. The causeway also destroyed fish stocks as various species such as salmon were unable to navigate the fishway that was built into the causeway structure. So, uh, so Moncton is over here, the, the suburbs they were trying to connect with are on this side, and these are the gates um, that were very infrequently opened that uh, closed, uh, they closed off the river. And fish had difficulty navigating the causeway structure. Fisheries officials had warned the MMRA engineers uh, that this would happen. Uh, the correspondence is actually quite interesting. The, the fisheries officials were sure they knew what they were talking about. The MMRA engineers told the fisheries officials to mind their own business and uh, effectively showed no concern. And finally, the causeway was responsible for the creation of a large head pond, the blue water, if you will, uh, upstream. So this is upstream. Uh, if you kept going in the opposite direction, you would come to the Bay of Fundy. Upstream, you had fresh water, um, runoff water uh, that then was blocked by the causeway on the, on the inland side. Uh, this large head pond, uh, which came to be known as Lake Petticodiac by individuals who constructed high-end properties along their lake. So the story of the construction of the Petticodiac Causeway is, to my mind at least, a classic example of what the sociologist James C. Scott has called high modernism, a way of thinking that allowed experts, in this case, the MRA engineers and their colleagues, to ignore the advice of others because they knew better based upon their particular form of expert knowledge. Ironically, in its earlier actions, as it reconstructed the dikes in Abato, the same engineers listened carefully to farmers and incorporated modern engineering practices into the older ways of managing the dike land environment. So I always found kind of interesting that in fact, these engineers had no difficulty when they actually were so inclined uh, to listen to what we might call more local forms of knowledge uh, by the 1960s, they had decided that uh, they knew better and could ignore advice from various quarters they were given as to what would happen if they built this, well, many of the dams and this one in particular that we're talking about today. But by the 1960s, uh, this regard for the view of others and the specificity of any project had disappeared with the dramatic results that I described, the narrowing of the channel, the destruction of fish stocks, the destruction of the boar, and the creation of the head pond. The Scott has noted, and so this is Scott, James Scott speaking now, the lack of context and particularity is not an oversight. It's a necessary first premise of any large scale planning exercise. With regard to such exercises that might affect the natural world, Scott pointed to the high modernist narrow focus on a particular goal. So in this case, the goal, the sole focus of the MMRA engineers was the crossing of the Petticodiac. Like I said earlier, it was entirely a transportation project. In the process, ignoring other factors such as, and now I'm quoting Scott again, such as the well-being of the community. As he puts it, the clarity of the high modernist optic is due to its resolute singularity. The simplifying fiction is that for any activity or process that comes under scrutiny, there's only one thing going on. And, and this is apt because time and time again, when problems uh, were pointed out to the MMRA engineers, uh, their focus on building this thing precluded their ability to think about almost anything else. 
So with the completion of the causeway, an environmental battle began that only concluded in 2021 with the removal of the gate structure, which had already been permanently opened in 2010. So this uh, image effectively shows what uh, we have today, the gate structure, uh, which used to be which used to be here, uh, is now a bridge across the river. Uh, the gates are gone, um, as is the head pond, because uh, upstream, uh, where there had once been a head pond, uh, the river is flowing once again. So for my purposes today, I want to focus on elements of that debate that went on for 50 years that indicated various perspectives of what constituted nature was natural. So I want to come back to the points I was making at the, bit, the beginning about our, how easily we're, seduc we're seduced by ideas of what is natural. So effectively, debate was one between individuals concerned about the degradation of the river and the fish that long freely moved up and down its length on the one hand, and those who had built lives for themselves along Lake Petticodiac on the other. So I don't want in any way to demean the efforts of those who for decades worked tirelessly to remove the causeway. But I do want to draw attention to how they conceptualized the natural state of the Petticodiac River and its watershed. This conceptualization came out quite clearly in the statement by two, by the statement that we'll see in a second, of two of the leading activists in the anti-causeway movement, Gary Griffin and Julia Chadwick who wrote about how the original Acadian construction of dikes had had, as they put it, little effect on the creatures which depended on the uniqueness of the Petticodiac for their existence. The dike structures were constructed in such a way as to allow fish and wildlife passage. So you need to kind of step back to think about what's being said here. And, and they weren't unique in saying it. Writing in this manner, Griffin and Chadwick naturalized the diked landscape, ignoring the marshland that had preceded it and that was destroyed by it. In the process, they obscured how the salt marshes had supported species that had now lost their source of nutrients, a process that in certain ways paralleled the compromise of fish stocks by the causeway itself. Indeed, this earlier marsh landscape had been vital to the lives of the indigenous people. And so ignoring that particular environment in a sense marginalizes the experience of indigenous people in the Petticodiac watershed. I'll just say uh, as an aside here that in, in doing my research uh, for this larger project about the MMRA, I found repeatedly uh, people saying that there was really nothing to be gained by returning to, uh, to salt marshes, that salt marsh didn't produce anything, uh, when in fact we know the salt grasses uh, can actually be used in a whole variety of contexts, but this was barely recognized so as to make, uh, so as to provide justification for the drained dike land landscape that I've been talking about. In his 2001 report regarding the options for the Petticodiac, Eugene Niles, the former Department of Fisheries and Oceans official, made the astute observation that the removal of the causeway would result in returning the landscape to some earlier form of nature. Recognizing that there had been more than one form, he wondered how far back should one attempt to turn the clock in restoration efforts? This is, this is a pertinent question. For example, he asked, should we attempt to restore all the former wetlands and salt marshes that have been drained and diked over the past three or four centuries and are now being used as productive farmland. And Niles was one of the few people that asked the question. In the end, even though the question was asked, no one seriously proposed returning the original marshland, marsh landscape. And so work proceeded in the early 2000s to prepare the river for the return of tidal flow with the construction of new dikes in Abato that would be in place by the time that the gates were permanently open in the spring of 2010. So effectively what they were doing was the work that the MMRA had been doing back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, building, in this case, rebuilding uh, dikes in Abato so that the river could flow as it had before and the land could return to the drained marsh landscape uh, that existed elsewhere in the region. So the idea was effectively to be sure 
that the salt marsh landscape would not return. However, it's worth recognizing, uh, if we're talking about nature, that salt marsh has value in its own right, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and should not be viewed as an inconvenience, which often was the case, standing in the way of restoration of the dike landscape. So this point has been made quite convincingly by Professor Danica Van Prusty of St. Mary's University, who's been advocating the use of salt marsh, particularly along the banks of rivers and coastlines that will be subject to ever higher tides due to the climate emergency. Marsh grasses are able to absorb some of the force of the tides, and so would allow protection to adjacent land without the construction of large and expensive protective structures which would have an impact on the shape of the landscape, just as the Petticodiac Causeway had reshaped the watershed of that river. As Van Prusty explained, in addition to providing a valuable ecosystem for birds and many commercially important fish species, a well-functioning salt marsh creates a buffer from storm surges. So uh, some of you, some of the people in the audience may know that there's a lot of discussion taking place in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia about how to deal with ever increasingly high um, tides and uh, uh, ocean levels. And uh, Van Prusty and some of her colleagues have been trying to advocate uh, for the use of more natural, I think we can say that accurately here, more natural forms of protection. Uh, but by and large, uh, governments have been very slow uh, to accept those ideas being seduced, maybe a bit like the MMRA was seduced uh, by uh, building large uh, engineering projects. Um, but I think in a way, the MMRA story provides us an opportunity to reflect not only on the past, but also what we might wanna do in the future. At the other extreme in the debate over the future of the Petticodiac River were the residents who constructed homes along their lake. And I should say the people who opposed the Petticodiac Causeway never refer to a lake, uh, always calling it a head pound. In fact, when I first started doing this project and it was interviewing people who lived along what they call Lake Petticodiac, I looked, I looked at maps to find Lake Petticodiac, but of course it doesn't exist, it's a head pond. In spite of over 100 studies indicating that the causeway had created a number of significant environmental problems, these residents insisted that there had been a general misunderstanding of the ecosystem that they inhabited, claiming that they were in fact environmentalists in their own right, trying to protect the natural landscape that had evolved over the decades following construction of the causeway. Uh, so I found many letters uh, such as the one we're gonna look at now uh, in the uh, Provincial Archives in Brunswick, and one of the residents uh, who lived along the lake, the head pond, if you will, uh, observed the following. I'm very concerned about the decision of our government to have the gates open. This will definitely ruin the lake and the surrounding ecosystem. I had the opportunity of seeing the beauty of this artificial lake and surrounding area with its abundance of birds and wildlife. It has the potential of all kinds of water activities if it were not for the threat of destroying the lake by opening the gates. So in my opinion, this person said, we are the true naturalists. We are the environmentalists. We are trying to save the lake and the surrounding ecosystem, not destroy the lake, always the lake, never a head pond, just to satisfy the wishes of people whose intentions might be good, but unrealistic, that they think the river will go back to the way it was before the causeway. Well, in fact, it has gone back, but I'll come to that in a moment. Or as another resident put it, when the lake was there, we couldn't wait till five o'clock. When our jobs were done, we'd come home, run down to the lake, get on our sailboat, sail for hours, motor for hours. It was pleasant. It was summer to go. Back then, it was a place for nature. In the end, however, the residents lost. And in 2010, when the gates were open, the lake was drained. And the ramp leading to once had been a marina became a road to nowhere. But more significantly and positively, the Petticodiac, once called Canada's most endangered river, has come back to something approaching, something approaching its pre-causeway state, which is say a return to the dike landscape, suggesting that environmental degradation can be reversed. So what we're looking at here uh, across the, the, the river, um, Moncton is in the distance, so this picture is being taken from the suburb side. Um, the grasses that you see on the far side of the river here um, are marsh grasses, 
that had grown for uh, 50 years or so on the large buildup of sediment. And so what looks like a bit of a cliff uh, on the far side of the river is in fact the accumulated um, sediment to build up over 40 years, uh, you'd have to go uh, another half a kilometer or so at least further back in order to get the full width of the river as it once existed. Uh, over time, uh, the projections are that some of this will be eaten away, but the whole river was not reopened. They only reopened uh, where the gate structure had been. And so there'll never be enough flow of the river to turn, return the Petticodiac exactly to what it was before. But having said all that, almost immediately, uh, fish stocks rebounded and the free flow of the river up and down its full length allowed it to begin to erode the sediment that had built up over more than 40 years. In addition, there was a return of the tidal bore and with it, surfers returned to the Petticodiac. And so this has become a bit of a game. Uh, surfers now come regularly to the Petticodiac and I think they've broken uh, the, uh, the world record for the longest, the single longest uh, run by a surfer on a single wave because you can go uh, 40 kilometers upstream. Well, to see these developments is anything but positive. But at the same time, I hope I made the point in this presentation that what we see in the Petticodiac is still the result of a human intervention that created the dike landscape. So we didn't go back to salt marsh and the nature, if that's the way you want to put it, that we're looking at is the one that was constructed uh, by settlers beginning in the early 17th century. So while this landscape may appear to be natural, as opposed to the degraded river shaped by the causeway, it's still a long way from the small marsh that dominated prior to the arrival of Europeans. So that's really the end of my presentation. But before we open this up for questions, I just want to take a minute for some shameless self-promotion. It's probably just as well that I'm sitting alone at home and I don't have to actually look into anyone's eyes while I, uh, while I do the shameless self-promotion business. So this presentation and all the visuals that were uh, included today uh, are drawn from my latest book published by UBC Press entitled Against the Tides, Reshaping Landscape and Community in Canada's Maritime Marshlands. So the, the Pentecodiac story is a small part of a larger story uh, dealing with the MMRA. Uh, and you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner of the cover, those are the surfers that we saw, we saw earlier. Uh, I believe the organizers of the series are going to be sending an offer provided by, by my publisher to get a 50% reduction for the purchase of the hardcover, but the hardcover is ridiculously overpriced. So frankly, even at 50%, it's still, you know, more than you should spend. Uh, or, or you can wait another four or five weeks because in August, the paperback version, um, which is much affordable, much more affordable is coming out. And you don't have to wait at all. And you don't have to spend any money in order to watch a documentary film uh, that we made uh, that accompanies the book. Uh, so the film, A Natural Landscape, uh, I produced. Uh, it's directed by the Montreal filmmaker, Vidari Bear, uh, and it's available um, at, the, uh, at the site noted here on the screen, unnaturallandscapesoneword.ca. So I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your feedback. All right, thank you very much, um, Professor Rudin, for that interesting lecture. And thanks also to the generous um, offer that you've given us. Um, I must, before we, we enter the question and answer session, um, I must say that if you have any contribution, if you have any question um, to ask Professor Rudin, you can just slot it into the chat box. I'll feed these to him as and when they become available. Um, I actually experienced a little technical challenge, and so I may have lost all the questions that probably have been submitted prior. If anyone has submitted any such question, please, I'll beg of you, resubmit them and I'll read them to Professor Rudin. Um, but Prof, um, um, if I, since there is no question in the chat box yet, I would, I would, I would, I'd start off by asking a question. Um, um, Unfortunately, I lost the larger part of your presentation because of the technical challenge, but there's something that intrigues me about your presentation, and that is um, the role of academia uh, and how it can impact policy uh, directions when it comes to environmental protection. 
Um, I'm wondering if the research that you've done all this while regarding the, the changes that have happened on the petit Kodiak, if, if you would say that academia has been able to so far impact policy in a much more better way than it used to be in the past. Um, I don't know what your opinions are on this academia and then policy, you know, impact. Well, I'm still struggling with the idea that maybe nobody heard most of my talk if you didn't, but I'll, um, I'll just go ahead. Um, well, um, you know, acad there are academics and there are academics. I mean, some are more, you know, much more oriented towards policy. I have to say my, my work has never been explicitly oriented towards, uh, sort of towards, uh, influencing policy. But I, I think in the current situation, um, you know, if we look at a case like uh, Dr. Kavan Prusty's that I described earlier, uh, I, I think it's a challenge because, uh, you know, here we have a, a highly respected uh, uh, person uh, in her field uh, who's trying to convince policymakers that there are more natural ways, less intrusive ways to be able to respond to the environment and the challenges that we're facing. And then the reality is that in the uh, reports that have uh, fairly recently been uh, been tabled uh, in uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, that advice has largely been ignored. So, um, you know, I, I can't say that I feel, uh, I feel overly confident, but I, you know, I, I, I think we have to recognize that we're a bit on the outside and we have to do the best we can to try to, to to, uh, to influence those who actually do have power. I wish I could be more optimistic. <laughs> All right, um, thank you. So um, there are some questions that have been slotted in the chat box. And Professor Rudin, my apologies. It was only I who experienced the, the technical challenge for the larger majority of your, virtually the entirety of your presentation, everyone was, was tuned in and so people heard you. Well, you know, it raises the question, you know, if uh, a tree falls on an island and no one hears it, was any noise made? But we'll, uh, we'll move on. All right. There's a question from Professor Dominique Marshall. What have been the main discoveries of this historical research for you? What you did not see coming? Uh, what I did not see coming. Well, I didn't see any of it coming, actually. The... Um, so the I'll, I'll backtrack a bit. So, so when I started doing this project that resulted in the book and that film, uh, the only thing I knew was about uh, the Petticodia Causeway. Um, I, uh, I had done previous projects that had me spending a lot of time in Moncton. I came to know pretty well people that were involved in the uh, campaign against the causeway. Um, but what I didn't see coming was that there was this organization, uh, the Maritime Marshland Rehabilitation Administration, um, that not only built the causeway, but had been responsible for reshaping the landscape throughout no, uh, that, the Bay of Fundy region in both New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And I didn't see it coming because, frankly, nothing had been written. Uh, nothing had been written about it. Nothing had been written about it because the archives had been lost. Uh, and through a whole series of uh, coincidences and accidents, I found the archives. So um, I guess, you know, if, if you ask me that question about what, what surprised me, well, what surprised me was that there was, uh, there was a significant body of, uh, of material, of information uh, that could allow us to see a government agency working for um, over two decades to, uh, to reshape the environment. And, and for me, it, it became a story, and um, maybe I could have anticipated some of this from previous research I had done. It became a story about forms of knowledge. Um, very strikingly, when you had farmers who uh, had developed techniques, the building of dikes and abaco for 300 years to be able to manage the landscape, on the one hand, having a kind of local knowledge, and on the other hand, the engineers from the MMRA who had their own expert knowledge. So this is the, the sort of things that James Scott writes about. Um, and what I, what I found interesting was that this relationship was complicated. It wasn't as if expert knowledge always trumped um, local knowledge. In fact, what we see, and I mentioned this in my talk for the first uh, 15 years or so of its history, those engineers worked with the farmers, 
And then something shifts. And in part to justify the continued existence of the MMRA, they moved into the second phase when they built title devs. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that I didn't see when I, I thought I had a small project dealing with the Petticodia Causeway, which just happens to be what I'm talking about today. But in fact, it turned into, as a surprise to me, a much larger uh, project dealing with a federal government agency that we effectively knew nothing about. All right, thank you. Um, there's another question. Um, how have your results been received so far? To which communities are they meaningful? And this is coming in from Professor Dominique Marshall. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, it's been, I, I think it's been, I, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm not the right one to say this. I, I think it's been well received. I, I think people have recognized that there's a there's a kind of balance in the book. I I haven't I haven't painted uh, the okay. I have to I have to backtrack a little. It, it would be easy to portray the MMRA engineers as somehow evil, especially if you focus on the Petticodia Causeway. But the fact of the matter is that there was this earlier experience, this earlier period. Uh, when the MRA worked with farmers. And in fact, it was the farmers who needed the help uh, and who were grateful for the fact that the federal government came in and uh, provided the resources to rebuild the dikes in the Aboto. And so I make that point. I Okay, so I've been uh, criticized, I think correctly in the past, sometimes for being a little too... Uh, eager to criticize people like the engineers in the MMRA. They're easy to take, uh, uh, to aim criticism at. But in this case, um, I think the farmers, and, and, and I've, uh, I've talked to farmers who, who've read the book, um, I think they, they appreciate the fact that um, I was able to see that they needed the help of the engineers and that the engineers worked with them and at the same time, those farmers have, you know, nothing, no reason to particularly support the more radical, what I would call more radical solutions of the MRA when they built the tidal dams. Um, as for the people who lived along Lake Petagodiac, I have to admit I haven't spoken to them. Um, they, but I, I didn't mean for them to come off as somehow evil or wrong either. Um, most of them. Um, moved into their properties along uh, what they called the lake after the causeway was constructed. For them, there had been no previous form of nature. They bought land along a lake and they built lives accordingly. And so um, I know in the campaign against the causeway, sometimes these individuals were portrayed very negatively, um, seeming to be more concerned about their properties than about the uh, environmental degradation of the river. Uh, I tried in the book to have a more balanced kind of approach to recognize that they had their own worldview, even though it might not be one that I entirely share. So I guess to say in, in, in balance, I think people have, uh, have you know, been okay with, uh, with the book. Yeah. All right, so um, there is, a question from Pete Grant. I understand that there is a similar grassroots movement underway to address the mem Memorial Cook Causeway. Okay, I think that is a contribution. Yeah. Is a story there pretty similar? Thoughts about how it might be done differently? So that's a question. Yeah. Okay, so my, my well, thank you, Keith. <laughs> my, uh, my easy answer to this is that they built the Mem Memorial Cook Causeway after the MMRA. So uh, I didn't do a lot of research into it, but the, the, the story is much the same, right? That the landscape, wherever, wherever uh, these causeways were built, um, that uh, head ponds were created. I think it's important in, in for maybe for a second to step back and think about the difference between Dykes and Aboiteau and what they did for, in terms of water, retention of water, as opposed to a dam. So the point of, a, of an Aboiteau uh, as we saw in, in, in that drawing at the beginning of my presentation, the point of an ablito is to push the water out so that you end up with uh, all the water on the inland side of the dike being pushed out uh, towards the sea. Uh, whereas 
a dam is a fixed link. It's designed to block water and to retain it. I mean, you, you might, you have gates on a dam normally to lower the level from time to time if it gets too high, but effectively the point of a dam is to retain water. And so in the case, of, to, so to come to your question, in the case of the member cliff, again, the river was seriously degraded uh, as a result. And so, um, and so, uh, it would, it would, I can understand why people would be interested in uh, deconstructing it. Uh, and, and to follow on that, uh, in Nova Scotia, there is a, a very similar kind of story, the, the kind of twin, if you will, to the Petticoatia Causeway was a dam that was built across the Avon River in Nova Scotia. For those of you who know, who know the geography, uh, this is at, uh, at Windsor. Uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, not far from Grand Pre. And, and there, uh, you have a very similar story where the river, uh, where fish stocks were compromised, where a head pond uh, took shape, where there's been a massive buildup of, uh, of sediment and of salt marsh. In fact, the salt marsh that was created downstream from the dam uh, that the Emma Murray built uh, on the Avon River is, is said to be one of the fastest growing salt marshes in the world, um, but built by, but, but created by, by happenstance because of the causeway, because of the Avon Causeway. So there was also a campaign there, all this to say, there's also been a campaign there to try to find ways to reconstruct that structure as well. And, and of course, across, uh, in many places in the world, we've seen the decommissioning of dams. So the whole idea of trying to, to, to go back and to undo some of the impact uh, is a larger process. But I would just caution us always, whenever we go back to ask where we're going back to. Um, because again, as we saw in the case of Petticoatia Causeway, uh, when you go back, you're not necessarily going back to the beginning. You're not necessarily going back to salt marsh. You may be going back to something like the dike landscape, which was in its own right, a kind of human intervention. Okay, all right. Um, the next question comes to you from Alan Jones, who I believe is a native of New Brunswick, and he finds your presentation quite interesting. Um, he's asking, do you see a connection between the MMRA and the, modern, the other modernization projects in New Brunswick that were ongoing in the 1960s, like the construction yes. of the Maktakak Dam and urban yes. renewal in St. John? Yes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So the larger context, thank you for that question. It lets me... Uh, Let's me talk about other things I've written about. So um, yes, so there's a moment, um, you know, uh, in many parts of the world after World War II, where we have this, we have this, this ideological um, predisposition that uh, James Scott has called high modernism. Uh, this notion that experts uh, know better and can radically transform the environment. And so, yes, I entirely, yes, it's, that was not a, a, federal, uh, a federal project, that was largely a provincial project, but, but I don't think it matters. There, there was a kind of intellectual predisposition uh, to use technology uh, in order to radically transform the environment. And in Atlantic Canada, we can see various examples of that. Mactaquac is one, another, which I've written about was the was the construction in the late sixties of Kushibagwak National Park, um, where uh, over a thousand people were removed from their homes in order to create a national park. And this, in its own way, was also a kind of high modernist project because you were simply moving people out of the way to radically transform the landscape. So I guess you can say that I've been interested for a long time in these projects um, that are conceived. I guess you you could say from above which are imposed upon the people who live on the land, uh, sometimes with very negative consequences. So yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's not by the same people, but it's certainly Mac the Quack and uh, the MRA projects. The MRA projects in terms of the dams, uh, th they all come out of the same ideological moment, yeah. And um, there's a follow-up to his question. He's also asking, why do you think the new Brunswick government so eagerly embraced these high modernist projects in the yeah. 1950s and 1960s? Was it just the federal government's willingness to throw money at the province? Mm 
Well, no, I, 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 well, it wasn't always in the realms of government. I mean, you can find, uh, I mean, we could take the example, we could take many examples around the world. We could, we could look at Quebec, you know, where I am at the moment, that, you know, Hydro-Quebec uh, became a symbol uh, of the modern Quebec state uh, in constructing, particularly in the north, again, uh, large projects that radically transform the environment. So, uh, well, it is true uh, in the cases of like Kushibaguak National Park, that the provincial government was seduced by federal funds. Um, the fact is that there was, again, to come back to my, my, my previous answer, there was a kind of ideological moment when there was a belief that technology, engineers transforming the environment, that this was all a positive kind of thing, like uh, harnessing nature uh, was a kind of sign of modernity. We could say that in New Brunswick, there was a certain seduction uh, by uh, you know, uh, the idea of New Brunswick en entering modernity. I think that was true in Quebec too, the idea that hydro was a kind of expression of Quebec's uh, modernity. But I, but I think we'd be selling uh, the whole thing short if we focused on New Brunswick or any one place. I think we need to understand that, that this was a particular ideological moment when the radical transformation of the environment was, was accepted in a large, to a large extent. So thank you for those questions. All right. Thank you, Prof. Um, um, there is no question yet in the chat box, but there, there, there are two issues that I would want to um, touch on and, and, and probably pick up your, your views on that. The first one is in relation to, I mean, when you talked about the changes on the Petit Kodiak, um, you know, the large... Uh, infrastructure changes that came to bear on that particular part of the environment. There is there's one sub layer of the entire argument that you know stirs up in my thoughts, and that is land reclamation. Uh, if you look at the advent of modernity and the attendant, you know, scientific and you know infrastructural uh, developments that have become the norm, you realize that if you look at the countries in the Gulf and in in many other European countries, there are strenuous attempts at trying to reclaim land from the sea. Um, you know, similar to this, if you look at here in Africa, there are people, you know, that are trying to reclaim portions of lands that are marshy lands, lands, you know, from river bodies, you know, they, they, they carry trips of sand and you know, track loads of stones and sand, fill these to the brim, and then ultimately they're able to get, you know, a land that could serve as the base for the infrastructure project. I'm wondering what your own personal, you know, and, and academic views are on this particular subject. I mean, in the interim, whilst people are able to claim these lands, um, it offers them the chance to, you know, construct houses, go on with the infrastructure projects, and it satisfies that, you know, interim need. But ultimately, these lands, these environments, are no more the same. You know, there, there's quite some element of, uh, you know, far-reaching changes that come to bear on these particular environments, you know, and especially the ecological make of these environments. I'm, I'm wondering what your own views are on these, you know, grand designs of infrastructure developments that are tied in with land reclamations from, uh, you know, river bodies. Well, it's certainly not for me to uh, pass judgment on land reclamation projects on parts of the world that I'm certainly not an expert on. Um, but of course, at the beginning, if we go back to the 17th century, what the Acadians and the people who followed them after the deportation, what they, what they were engaged in was a land reclamation project, right? I mean, that's what they were doing. Uh, so when they built the dikes in the Abuato, they were reclaiming. Okay, reclaiming. Okay, I'll, I'll just I'll just question it, the the use of the term reclaiming, uh, as if the proper form of the land is with the water removed that we're reclaiming it, as if it was something that we have a right to. I think we have to be a little careful about the language that we often use because I th I think this is part of the problem that the natural form that we think we're aspiring to is moving these inconveniences out of the way and reclaiming it for us uh, or claiming it for us. I'm not sure what the re part even is. 
so I think we have to, I guess my, my point in all of this is just to get us to think through what we mean or what we think we're doing. Uh, so I don't have necessarily an objection to the fact that the dikes in Yawato were constructed. Um, the people who took over indigenous lands, so we have to recognize that to begin with, uh, came from Europe with a certain conception, a certain vision of what land looked like. And they had experience in building dikes uh, in Europe. And so they used that, they used the technology they had in order to construct an environment that was familiar to them. Okay, but and I think this is, would be true in any environment. We have to recognize that for every human intervention is going to be some cost. And the cost in the case of land reclamation, if we want to use that expression, uh, in uh, New Brunswick, in Nova Scotia, along the, the Bay of Fundy, the cost was the destruction of salt marsh. And unless we're going to say that salt marsh is of no value and deserve to be destroyed, uh, then I think we have to think through the costs that went along with the advantages. And so the only thing I would say in terms of these environments of land reclamation that I know nothing about is to that we always need to be mindful that there's a cost. So if there is land reclamation, what's being destroyed or what's being taken away or what implications will there be if the land is reclaimed, so to speak? And, you know, I think we often assume, and this comes back again to uh, a bit about high modernism, that we, we kind of presume that technology is good, imposing it uh, will be helpful, and we don't think as much about the cost. So, so that would be my, uh, my, my cautionary note, is that as positive as it might seem to reclaim land, um, I don't like that term, but you got me stuck now. Uh, but if we're going to try to make land available that hadn't previously been available, there's going to be a cost that we need to reflect on what those costs are. All right, thank you, Prof. Um, probably the last two questions. Um, this one is coming in. It says, do you see similar blind attitudes now in Canada or New Brunswick, or are stories like this one slowing down enthusiasm for rapid mm -hmm. developments such as this one? And yeah. My apologies, let me slot in one more question from my end. Um, with the long years of your research you know, in this area, um, how have you seen the, the critical question of compensa adequate compensation to local communities that are impacted by these high modernist you know, projects? How have you seen that issue you know, interrogated or, or settled? Uh, okay, so there were two questions there. Um, so the first one um, had to do with uh, more recent projects that seem to be in the same, might be in the same, um, in the same vein. Well, I, I think they're coming. Um, again, there, there are plans already being, uh, you might not be surprised to know that there are plans being uh, discussed as we're here today somewhere um, about what to do with uh, rising uh, ocean levels. And all of the plans uh, are, are technologically driven and um, are devoted towards building uh, higher and stronger. And I understand that, but then again, there are alternatives, right? So we have these alternatives. This is why I talked about the salt marsh as a tool, a natural tool, if you will, uh, in our toolbox. So I, I, I think, we, I didn't quite realize when I started doing this project that I would finish it uh, around the same time. How could I have known that I would end up finishing it around the time that uh, serious plans are being made about what we're gonna do with climate change, which is going to threaten water coming again onto this land. Um, and I think the, the, the moral of the story that I've talked about is that we just have to be very cautious and careful about the implications of the technology that we impose. Okay, now there was the second question, which I completely forgot. Yes, I was asking um, how you've seen the question of adequate compensation to local oh, yeah. communities that are dotted around, you know, these yeah. east sides of, you know, large industrial projects. Yeah. Um, well, invariably, invariably, people aren't compensated very well. Um, 
that was the case. Uh, that was the case in turn to Mactaquack. The Mactaquack example in New Brunswick that was described earlier, there was a get there, much like in Gushbaguac, a, a significant movement of people uh, from their lands when they were flooded. Uh, the compensation was never adequate. Uh, when the people were moving their lands at Gushbaguac to build a national park, there was little, uh, there was little compensation. Uh, but and of course the 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 indigenous people received no compensation uh, for the land that was taken from them uh, when settlers came and constructed this dike land marsh uh, this dike uh, environment that that I've been talking about. So I, I think it's fair to say that, that, that part of that moment that I was trying to describe earlier uh, was one in which technology ruled and the people who were actually subject to it uh, were treated largely with neglect. Okay, thank you, Professor Rudin, for that. I think David Miller is adding a contribution. He says, to be fair, building a dam in New Brunswick reduced coal power generation a lot. As someone who owns, co owns land downstream, it improved the health of the river downstream because very low water levels that used to occur are much less common than when I was a kid. Yeah. All right, so. On that note, um, sorry, I don't know, Professor Rudin, if you wanted to pass a comment on that 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 observation. Well, my, you know, it's the same point I made before. I think that you know we can build things that often have advantages, but they also have costs. So you know, I don't deny in any of these cases that someone somewhere, uh, and not insignificantly, could benefit. But at the same time, there are also costs. I mean, the people who had you know in the Mactaquack case, uh, which has been written about extensively by others. Um, you know, there, there were costs that were absorbed by the people who lost their lands, who found them flooded, who were removed, who were told that they needed to be re-educated in order to be able to make it in the real world. You know, there, there, there's a larger package there. And so we always, and this comes back to my answer to you about land reclamation, we always need to be conscious of not just accepting the kind of um, easy, sometimes easy way to see advantages, without digging deeper and also seeing the cost. All right, thank you very much. And on that note, um, I think we'll draw the curtains down to this particular presentation. And since this presentation happens to be the last in the spring series, um, we'd want to sign off by saying a special thanks to some individuals that have been so, so significant to the organization of this particular series. But before we do that, um, sorry, Professor Rudin, are there any concluding remarks, um, 30 seconds roughly, that you'd want to share with us? Oh, no, I think you've heard everything Everything I have to say on the subject. Uh, I, I, All right. thank, I thank you for putting this together. Thank you, too. Yes, so before we, we move away, let us um, acknowledge the special contributions of these individuals. Um, first, we want to say thank you once again to all sponsoring units that joined the organization of the series. The Department of Sociology and Anthropology School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies, Institute of Political Economy, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Science, Institute of African Studies, and then also to some individuals that have been so instrumental in the organization of the series. Specifically, we want to mention Alex Pilkenton with IMS and all his colleagues that came in to join us from IMS. Imanolo Wusu Ansan, um, who is with the College of Education Studies, University of Cape Coast, who provided internet services to me in hosting this. And then also to Philip Enifo, who works with the IT Wells, the one who designed all the flyers for this particular presentation. And also a special thanks to you out there for making time to attend the series. Finally, we would want to say a special thanks to Professor Dominic Marshall, who is the chair of the Shannon Endowment Committee and co-organizer for the series. I don't know if Professor Marshall wants to say a word or two before we sign up. Uh, just uh, one word to thank you, Stephen. It's the first day in, in 20 years of the Shannon Lecture Series, there has been four series who were convened by a doctoral student, so you're number four but you're certainly the one who did the transnational version of it by hosting it from Ghana. And you're the second one only who did one virtual one. So you had a double challenge which you held very well. And I thank you for your thoughtful questions today. And also uh, I thank Ron for 
it, the, an extraordinary story. I will teach a course next fall on the theme of the Shannon series, and I will be delighted to show your film and have them watch this recorded series and uh, read your book. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Professor Marshall. Yeah, so on that note, I would want to mention that the next series of the Shannon Lecture um, series in history comes off in the fall of 2022, and is going to be held with the title Climate History. It is going to be hosted by Professor Joanna Dean, who is Associate Professor of Environmental History at the Department of History, Carlton University. Um, and on that note, I would say it's been wonderful having you join us for the spring 2022 edition of the Shannon Lecture Series in History, which discuss critical issues on the environment yes, you know, on the transnational scope. Thank you very much. And until we meet again, stay safe. Bye for now. Bye.